Hi, everyone. Welcome to Credit Tech 2020, and thank you so much for joining this session. My name is Andres Vega, and I will be the facilitator for today's panel. Before we get started here, I'd like to briefly go over a few housekeeping notes before handing this over to our speakers. All participants will be on mute throughout the session, so if you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A section, which can be found below on your screen. Please note that these questions will be answered at the end of the presentation as we have some set time for a Q&A. All registrants will additionally receive a copy of the session recording within the next couple of days via email, or you can also access them on our Credit Tech website, which the link of can be found on your screen. If you'd like a PDF copy of the presentation sooner, please visit the Credit Tech LinkedIn page linked in the attachment section below. That being said, we welcome you for today's panel discussion on tech interventions to aid working capital management in crisis. Our moderator for today's panel is Sam Fensterstock, who is the Senior Vice President of Business Development at AG Adjustments. Sam has spent his entire business career as an entrepreneur and senior executive in the commercial credit and collection space. Sam has been a founder and key role player in the dynamic growth of several leading niche commercial credit risk management companies, including F&D Reports, Credit Risk Monitor, and Predictive Metrics, and is considered an expert in the order to cash and collect credit and collection process. Joining him today, we have Laurent Quaritain, who brings himself with more than 20 years of experience in the pharmaceutical sector and has created the customer invoicing to cash global process owner role in the Sanofi Business Services Organization. Prior to his current role, he has held multiple responsibilities within Sanofi and the business development, M&A, supply chain, and finance domains. George Uko, who is currently the credit manager with Staples Promotional Products, has over 20 plus years of credit management experience in various positions that he has held. He has worked with American Express, Commerce Bank, Buyer Animal Health, and Thermo Fisher, while also maintaining a background in fraud management. Sajish Kumar leads the Invoice to Cash Global Enterprise Service Line for Genpact and his team, which is responsible for driving innovation and digital transformation to unlock business outcomes within the credit and receivables management space for clients globally. With over 20 years of experience in order cash process gained by holding various roles within the order cash function as delivery operations lead, transformation lead, and solution architect. Sajis has a proven track record of working closely with multiple pan industry global clients across regions. So with all that being said, Sam, I will go ahead and hand it over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas, and appreciate you having me involved in today's presentation. So obviously, you know, we've all experienced uh, you know what has happened due to COVID, and, and a lot of the questions that we're going to we're going to throw at you today are, are on the basis of you know responding and, and and pivoting based on COVID. So, you know, the first question that I'm going to ask, which is really to to all members of the panel, um, you know, with the onslaught of COVID-19, you know, the luxury of time has disappeared completely. Businesses that once mapped digital strategy into one three-year phases now must scale their initiatives in a matter of days or weeks to keep their operations alive in a hunt to maintain a stable working capital. This has certainly shown a glimpse into a future world, one in which digital has become central to every interaction facing both organizations and individuals to further up the adaption curve almost overnight. So as industry experts, what do each of you think your views are on it and how have you justified that now is the perfect time to get you know businesses to gear up for, for digital transformation? What do you guys think? Do you want to answer each? Uh, how do we have, uh, Laurent, would you go first? Yes, thank you, Sam, and uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this to this conference. I think, uh, um, uh, for as a as a pharmaceutical company, we were we were hit very specifically and unexpectedly, I would say, by the by the COVID crisis, and we did a poll very recently, saying asking, you know, what uh, um, what this crisis has, has changed for you among the, the customer to cash or the credit to cash community and everybody was saying yes it's 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 really it's really giving us the the right time for a change and for a, a deeper transformation because we all face the same reality that all of a sudden there, there was a brutal surge in interest in our products in our sales 
distributor were asking to stockpile products at the very beginning of the crisis in, uh, because they were fearing of what was going on. And at the same time, we are losing all the traditional customer introduction interaction that we had uh, on, the, on the commercial side, but also on the, on the credit to cash side. And we had to cope with this new, new reality where, uh, obviously, uh, technology could bring something. And you know that pharma is, uh, is, uh, is often a, a slow adopter in, 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 um, in new technology. The, the digitalization transformation journey is something that we had started ways ago, and it was not really going fast. And I, I, I think that it's really about the, the sense of urgency and the, the, that this situation has created, and the fact that we were really faced with an ongoing demand from our customer to change the way the, 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 the relationship or relationship model was with them to have more third service options, for instance, and, and really to enrich our digital interaction across the sales cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you very much for that information. George, how do you guys do it over at Staples Promotional Products? We're doing pretty good. Thanks for the question, Sam. I would uh, tell you, in reference to your question, I would say yes, it's important for us to be up to date with the digital transformation. A uh, couple things that I definitely want to add to the previous speaker. You know, we really need to watch as far as the aging. We really need to monitor the day-to-day -day activities of the business. Given right now everything going on with sales slowing down, this and that, it's real important to monitor as far as what's on the receivables, what needs to be collected, and monitor as far as the sales. Now, one thing that we've noticed is by using the digital transformation or focusing on it, we're monitoring our accounts closer. And the other thing that I've been doing is we monitor as far as the accounts daily, where before we may have been looking at them on a weekly basis. Now we're doing it more on, uh, getting tongue-tied here. Before we were doing it on a weekly basis, now we're doing it more on a daily uh, basis. Other thing that we've noticed is by using software such as High Radius, we've been able to focus on uh, the higher end accounts. We've been focused on driving down as far as the DSO. And one thing that we've really focused on is working with our other partners. So our other partners being our sales group, they want to push the orders through. Well, now we're working closer together with them where before we weren't working probably as close as we should. So this is one thing uh, the digital transformation has really pushed us, and we're really monitoring as far as what we're approving day to day, and once again, what's coming through, and watching the aging day to day. Thank you, George. That's a great answer. Sanjeev, how, how are things? How are you guys handling things over at Genpack? Thanks, Sam, and a pleasure to be here first and foremost. Uh, so when I address your question. It's important to realize that digital transformation and its benefits have always been relevant uh, in the recent years. But what the pandemic has done, though, is to move the spotlight on every company to show either the pitfalls of being laggards in the digital journey or the benefits of having invested wisely. So the justification required is not why should you gear up for a digital transformation, but rather how should you gear up for it, if not already. The good news, though, is that digital transformation for finance is no longer just purely a finance-led initiative. It is more of an end-to-end business-led initiative. So companies are demanding their finance function to be its data custodian, to be its insights and value engine. That's an opportunity that has been magnified by the crisis, one that the finance function should de definitely deliver on. The companies that have embedded digital technologies are better placed to support this ask at this time especially at a time when CFOs also have also started taking up the role of an enterprise data guardian. So it is about looking at how you should be focusing on the key outcomes that you want to look across for the enterprise to deliver, rather than why you should. Great, great information, great information, Sanjus. All right, so I'm going to move on to my, my next question. Um, so, and this one is really directed uh, directly at uh, Laurent or Sanjus. Um, you know, no, just knowing that now is the time, that, that time is not enough, but a well-organized plan is what every business owner must look for. By now, every company in some or other term has at least a high-level idea how to pilot new digital mission is in normal times. But very few have 
do so at the scale and speed suddenly required you know, by COVID-19 and the crisis and how much pivoting every company has had to make. What do you think could be the major obstacles when planning a digital transformation project in the new normal? And what, according to you, should be that perfect agenda to successfully, successfully implement a digital transformation project in today's market? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a uh, great question. As, as as you can as you can think, I mean, the the crisis is not making anything easier, right? And uh, you know, those kind of transformation projects are always uh, uh, challenging to set up and 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 uh, and uh, uh, and requires a lot of uh, a lot of work for. Or that's uh, at least that's our case in uh, in our company. Maybe sometimes too much work. And now it, it's it's even worse because everybody is coming up with his own uh, uh, new digital transformation initiative that are fighting against each, each other in a in a in a in a context where uh, you know resource has uh, I mean resource scarcity is even worse than before. So that's that's really becoming challenging. And uh, in uh, I would say that the good, the 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 obstacles and the, the 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 good recipe are the same that we were trying to to put in place before. And I, I would say that for me, it's really you need to champion all the uh, digital tools, techniques, concepts that goes along such a transformation. And this is about the agility. This is about the quick implementation time. Uh, excellent project management and change management skill, and the right technology. And uh, I, I, I think you really need to demonstrate that you are able to champion across the board on all things. And for us, for instance, we had two big projects going on during the, the crisis, which were global projects where, for instance, we had to, to switch to a full remote implementation mode which was something that we had never uh, achieved before and that we, we, we had been talking about that and, and, and we were able to manage that. Uh, and, and this is going to become the norm for all the, the other projects. And, and the second example, I would say, I was uh, about to start a collection project under a very traditional approach of the solution design and so forth, uh, uh, sequential wave. And uh, the only way it was possible to keep it uh, alive and to go through was to 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 uh, to have a kind of game changer in the way we are implementing a project and abiding by a minimal viable product approach and much quicker implementation timeline in order really to show that we were able to beef up the ROI for the uh, in front of finance so so that's really the the, the kind of uh, uh, yeah, the kind of techniques that uh, that we we really need to be able to to, to master now. Did did, did uh, moving to uh, remote workforce uh, change that at all? Yes, of course. Uh, it, 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 I mean, it, it was even more challenging. But the, the big surprise is, you know, for the first time we were forced to operate under this context. We realized it was possible. And uh, everything that before was always something that uh, no, we need to have. Uh, you know, you need to travel in every country to see the, the local team and uh, and uh, and make sure that you do your UAT properly and so forth. All of a sudden, all this became impossible. So, at the end of the day, everyone realized that yes, it was possible to achieve that, and for, and that that's becoming a condition to move ahead. Uh, actually, yeah, yes, yeah, so we've seen that. You know, you know talking to a lot of our clients who've, who've had the same exact experience. Sanjeev, so, how, how, how have you guys dealt with that over at Genpact? So Sam, I, I strongly believe that a successful digital transformation has its foundation on strong domain knowledge and a clear business challenge to be solved for, right? And that changes sometimes within the company even to different business divisions as well across regions, across markets. But if I have to call out three primary uh, pitfalls that you probably have to look out for, and this is from multiple conversations and multiple transformations that we've been part of. One, and this is in no particular order. One, uh, we believe strong digital strategy always beats large budgets. So, <laughs> and this might be controversial in that sense, but there is a need to avoid falling into the trap of large investments and low returns, right? More money spent does not guarantee success. 
the intent should be more value outcome based reap to reinvest right the second component that is critical when you embark on this journey is about design transformation should be for the new normal not to get back to the normal c pre covid now what do i mean by that the pandemic has obviously changed the way businesses operate in most industries and most markets ranging from remote work that we just spoke about and also to the change in business dynamics and customer priorities all these are for good so if you plan to transform your business for an era that has evolved you will automatically fall short the third key thing that is necessary to be kept in mind is that do not at any given point of time sidestep domain and customer experience as you design your digital transformation roadmap domain know how is critical as a guiding light especially when you're going through uncharted waters at times keeping you in the right direction and more often than not it is very easy to let the focus move away from a customer centricity in the rush for internal automation and transformation which to be honest is very counterproductive in the long run so for a short answer is simple perfect agenda for a digital transformation would be to retrospect identify what are the long term objectives what are the short term medium term objectives to prioritize focus on targeted functions sub processes and then say why third plan what do you need what are the building blocks what are the options available in the market then you move into design and deploy lead with domain solve through digital in a very agile and focused manner post which you start reaping the benefits of automation elimination and disruption finally you look at learning feedback loop on what worked what did not share those learnings and practices all all great all great suggestions and you know obviously uh companies have to you know change and prepare for never going back to the way it was so you know some some great points um third question i'm going to start this one off throwing it at george um as more buyers disregard terms and adopt pushback strategies due to the covid pandemic it becomes critical for accounts receivable leaders to monitor credit and collections performance in order to secure the overall financial health of their businesses What are your views on this and how do you think digital transformation of technology could help businesses on that front you know based on what we're seeing today George Okay good question I think uh when it comes down to that um it's really trying to work with as far as the customer but as much as we want to work with them we still have to have the cash coming in per se so one of the things in the past maybe we had more leeway with as far as the terms but now we have to enforce the terms and really monitor the credit other thing we have to think of as we're going along maybe in the past we didn't really focus on as far as the new order did it match the purchase order nowadays we're putting more controls in place to make sure everything's done up front so that way the orders could go through as far as the system other thing that we may want to do uh that we actually have done For some of our customers we've given different terms but we've given the terms at the invoice level where in the past it was always set up at the account level. So what that's done is that's allowed some of our um higher end orders uh for example we sell some PPE products like the N95 masks maybe the N96 masks all those are going out the door in high volume. So in turn we have to pay some of our vendors up front to get these created and get them in our store to shouldn't say store but in the warehouse to get out to our customers. So what we've done is we've set up as far as different terms depending on the different orders. But what that's done is that's caused more work on the back end because now we have to go in and collect not only at the account level but also at the invoice level depending on the different terms. but given as far as the technology we have that's really given us that flexibility so that we could do that so once again that's very important that that we could do other thing to kind of think about we've had to go in update as far as our credit strategies we want to balance our strategies with as far as our customer but at the end of the day we really have to watch as far as the the credit the credit worthiness of as far as the customer But some things that we've done is we went in updated our collector's dashboard. We've gone in updated as far as our scoring, so it makes it easier for us to work the right accounts. And then we've also gone in and started looking at the individual credit analyst to make sure they're focused on the right accounts. So once again, uh getting back to your question, 
I think it's very important that we focus on the digital transformation and really use that technology to our advantage, but once again, balance the needs of our customers. Great information, George. Thank you so much. Lauren, what, how have you guys been seeing this you know, from your, your point of view over at your organization? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, for us, uh, I think it was as as I said, as business was was uh, was on an, on an increasing thing, at least at the at the beginning, it was all about uh, you know uh, uh, making sure that we had we were enforcing strictly our uh, procedures in terms of credit risk uh, management, in terms of order. Uh, all them release and in terms of payment term management and starts really chasing after the 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 the, the late customer on a much more um, uh, I would say uh, vigilant uh, way uh, because uh, we didn't know where uh, where we would uh, where we would uh, uh, evolve and and what w would be the impact so. We did actually a workshop across several countries in at the, in the middle of the, the first lockdown period, where we uh, we asked the, the different countries where they were struggling for and where their help, uh, where we could help them um, uh, manage the better. And the collection was really the, the top priority area because the rest they they were able to manage it. More or less uh, under a normal uh, uh, under a normal fashion, but as George said at the at the very beginning, where uh, everyone was struggling was despite the fact that a lot of them had good tools, of good uh, good uh, analytics, good dashboards, but they they were not able to to update their system as as um, as rapidly as as often as they would have liked. And we also were tending to have uh, weekly updates uh, rather than daily, and uh, this this was really uh, something that we had to change, and uh, and and that's where we uh, we we started again looking back to the to 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 move to the next generation uh, collection solution. In fact, uh, when uh, when I had started the uh, the, the overall transformation of the credit to cash function a couple of uh, years ago. Collection was obviously one of the key priority area, but the, the only reason why I didn't start by this area was because uh, it was easier to, ad to address cash application, for instance, or credit, because these were activities that were more bundled than the, co the pure collection business, which was very much scattered across the different countries. And as a result, when we did that, that workshop, as, a, as I mentioned, that, that was really the area where most of the, of the countries were still struggling with and looking to be more efficient, chasing up the, the right item and, uh, and making sure that uh, uh, that we were tracking uh, the uh, the right overdue on day one and uh, with the proper priority, which was which was really the the biggest pain point that everyone was having. Thank you so much for that information. Uh, we're going to move on to the next question, and we'll start off with Sanjish. Um, so, given everything that's been going on with COVID, what are the other areas within AR where you feel technology could create value? Uh, you know, personally, you know, we've seen uh, that there's been a spike in the need for real-time payments, deduction research automation capabilities, uh, straight through cash application. Could you share some examples from your end of automating, create automation, creating value for the cash beyond credit collections? Absolutely, Sam. And uh, so, but before I jump into the nitty-gritties of it, we need to be conscious that true digital transformation does not come purely from incremental simplification or standardization or automation, right? While continuous improvement is a key lever, disruption and elimination of the whole transactional AR effort is what will actually increase uh, help 
folks increase the focus on analytical and relationship-based portfolio management. That truly will push the limits of digital transformation for any business. In that context, I believe that plugging the leak in upstream functions assists a lot in completely eliminating the need for collections or disputes. More often than not, you look at credit and collections in silo. You need to start looking at it in terms of a customer to cash life cycle. You map the customer life cycle or the transactional life cycle in order to understand how the leakages needs to be blocked. There is a whole lot of Six Sigma DNA in me, so bear my reference as I make this point, right? If you look at collections as a defect, and defect, then disputes is therefore a defect on a defect. You would then be resolving the root cause of a reason to collect or to solve a dispute and then collect. More often than not, the root cause is a data mismatch or an information mismatch, unless it is just a bad payer who normally is a very small percentage of the portfolio. Now, you could call this oversimplification of a complex AR problem, but probably in this digital age, inability to solve data and information mismatch, which account for literally around 95% of delayed payments or disputes, is unacceptable, right? Similarly, a closer look at master data contract linkages, credit management rigor that George was talking about, alternate service product-based billing solutions, and payment options are critical focus points. The customer-to-cash function literally impacts um, key value outcomes that go just beyond cash and revenue. It impacts customer experience, user experience. It impacts uh, in terms of you know, margins and how your uh, overall business is actually growing. So those kind of components are beyond the mandates of a credit and collections uh, objectives, but does not mean that we do not have a larger say in terms of how we impact it. Uh, if you start looking at a customer lifecycle management, you get to see the sense of what are those specific four touch points that you actually have a very close interaction with. And by solving for each of those, you're actually plugging the leak right up front and making the AR receivables management process much more seamless in that nature. Thank you so much for that, for that, for that answer, Sanjay. George, how about how you guys take in your, your perspective at Stables? You know what, I'm going to agree with uh, what was previously stated, but I kind of want to add a couple points behind that. Uh, one of the main things I think we need to focus on as we look at, as far as automation, we look at order to cash, et cetera, I think the, the thing that we need to use the automation for is making it easier for the customer. So let me kind of dig a little further into this. So when I'm referring to the customer, I want the customer to be able to make their payments, I want them to be able to uh, go in, give us payment commitments. Uh, one thing that we've done at Staples, or we're in the process of doing, is allowing our customers to click on a link off their invoice or off their statement so they could go in and just make a payment. Or, better yet, they could click on that and tell us when they're going to send the payment. So what that's done is that's starting to reduce the number of our emails, number of phone calls, we're trying to make this more uh, self-sufficient for as far as our customers. So what that's going to do is make them happy, same token to hopefully bring in the money easier. And on top of that, one thing that we've noticed is if we give them that option, guess what? They apply the payment the way they want. So we don't have cash on account as much. And same token, they see the visibility of everything we see when we look at their account, and they apply as far as those payments. So it's just a matter, I think, with automation, making it work for both the customer and for you. And in this case, what we're finding is a lot of our customers are wanting more automation. They're wanting more control. They want the 24-7 where they could go in on the system and do what they need versus calling in. And not that we ever had a problem with our customer service. It's just they don't have time like they used to. Everybody's in a time crunch, and this is really – help both ends of the business. Thank you, George, so much for the answer. All right, we're rolling into the last question, guys. Uh, and this is for each one of you to, to give us your, your, your thoughts. Um, do you think it's important for finance leaders to understand the importance of artificial intelligence and RPA in order to future-proof their businesses against similar crisis situations? What are the, some of the lessons that you'd like to share with, with, with all practitioners that you feel be useful for them in the, in the post-COVID-19 world? Uh, why don't we have, uh, why don't George, you go first. Okay, thank you. I think uh, really at the end of the day, I think artificial intelligence, it's here to stay. It's just a matter of uh, fine-tuning it going forward. 
But some of the lessons I think that we've learned, and I'm thinking most everybody's probably found this out, is the more that we could adapt, the more we could change, the easier it's going to be for us, easier it's going to be for our sales group, easier it's going to be for as far as our customer. So that's one of the first things that we had to learn quickly is we need to adapt quickly. Other thing that we've noticed is now we have our sales department. They, in turn, are looking for uh, the right customers to reach out to. So now we're working closer because they want reports sooner. They want to work with us. And guess what? Now they want to help us collect so that they can get their orders out the door. So one other thing that we've noticed that really kind of stands out, and this is probably with all companies, communication is key right now. We have to stay on top of what's being shared whether it's with our customers, whether it's other departments such as sales or customer service, it's vital that we all work together. It's vital that we keep that communication going. Other thing that we've learned is we need to be quick in updating our credit scoring. There are some times where we need to tighten it down. There's other times we need to kind of loosen it up a little bit. But the big thing is the sooner we could tighten it down or loosen it up, make whatever change is needed, the more efficient we're going to be. And that's kind of one of those things that we're learning as we're going along is with all the changes, okay, which business is open, which business isn't open. And the other thing, we deal with all the different types of businesses, whether it's agriculture, whether it's pharmaceutical. So we have to adjust to all those different types of companies. But being able to go in behind the scenes and adjust through the system some of our different strategies and scoring has really made a huge difference. Sam, are you still here? I think someone want to jump next. I think Sam has got some connection issue. I I, I can take it up next if you want for me. I, I just, uh, hello, hello. Yeah. Hey, this is Sam. I'm sorry, uh, Laurent. You want to go next? Yeah, yeah. I'm going. Uh, yeah. What what um, what always strikes me with uh, artificial intelligence and this kind of technology today, it's really um, it's really uh, a concept that. Uh, uh, everyone embraces. Uh, that means that no one is no one is no longer going to question the use of artificial intelligence and so forth. But at the same time, a lot of people and a lot of finance leaders are still admitting that they need to learn about it. They need to to to, to learn how to use it to see the benefit and so forth. And my 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 key takeaway on, on that front is we should be careful to set the expectation right and because uh, I, I think it's it's almost in the world in in the concept of of uh, of uh, artificial intelligence that oversells it and you can't blame uh, finance people who have been uh, who's uh, have been a, a, a quite for a time away in certain cases from from the technology to have that kind of progressive and, uh, you know, uh, ends of trial approach in order to, to test it. I think one of the dreams that everyone is after is to say, okay, how can I can I predict how how my business is going to look like? And that's uh, uh, that's uh, for me that's a long way to go. And for me, the the um, the key element is. Try to be a little bit more modest and uh, and not be misled misled by the by the, the wrong expectation. And remember that artificial intelligence is all about uh, historical trends, big data, and uh, uh, you know uh, 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 setting predictive analytics to be, uh, where you can base scenario on on, on base scenario. So it's built upon mathematical mathematical models that have been existing for 20, 25 years already. What changes today is today that you get technology solution that comes embedded with all those technology and the fit for, to purpose use cases for uh, a certain uh, for a certain business. And that's that's what is for me 
creating uh, the the the, uh, the, the I mean changing the uh, the uh, the the um, uh, changing the, uh, the 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 way we we, we should operate. And uh, what I'm trying to um, to uh, to explain uh, is uh, I, I prefer talking about human machine collaboration, for instance, and you know to to um, to to defend the, the fact that we are looking at augmenting the human being in a way and making sure we translate certain activities into something which is more value driven for the customer. And I think that's really what the, the this technology is today enabling. And and the rest is still a little bit uh, uh, for, uh, still uh, uh, forward looking. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, are you hearing yeah. me? Okay, so, so, so uh, Sanjay, can you give us uh, your, your answer on this last question? So absolutely, Sam. Um, and uh, these are, there are two parts to your question, right? I mean, the first, uh, the importance of AI and RPA for future-proofing business. Let me address that first. And I so agree with Lauren and George. They were talk bringing up a topic of hybrid workforce, which is a very critical element of how you can actually embed AI in order to make the right decisions across in your workforce. I honestly believe that AI is being underutilized, especially in the finance world. We're probably using, uh, what is the analogy that I can give you? We're probably using an iPhone as a paperweight, right? That's literally it. But that's also driven to a large extent by proof points. Um, and the fact remains that when you go through AI, the prescriptive, predictive analytics component of it, pretty much every enterprise is on board with. They're trying to do things. Um, but there are bigger components, such as natural language understanding, natural language processing, machine learning components, which are still uh, evolving as such. And once it is at its peak period of proof points and engagements, you will see the value that the enterprise are driving is much, much more than what we have today. Right. So proof, future proofing with business with uh, digital tech, it is very critical. And probably right now is a great time to do that. Uh, never waste a good crisis, right? Uh, you just need to learn and prepare not to be surprised by the next one, and probably you will have those learning curves at this point of time. You did have a second part to your question, which was uh, what are the learnings for the business leaders right, uh, from the crisis? Um, I, I personally have four. Um, first and foremost, being more emotionally intelligent. I think everybody has been looking at the soft skill side of things. Dig beyond the generic how are you, over-communicate, respect and trust the remote working environment. Those kind of factors are critical uh, in this age. Two, align to the fact that there is no going back, right? Adapt to the new normal. Learn and understand what the new demands of the customer base is. Um, third, it is critical to understand that going digital is no longer an IT deliverable for the enterprise. It's a very core goal of a business leader, too. Uh, and finally, four is stay positive. I mean, if history is of any reference, the worst of times have been followed by great economic resurgence of mammoth proportions. So your business just needs to be digitally and emotionally ready when that arrives. Thank you so much for, for that for that response. All right, Andreas, I think that's all the questions we had for today. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, move forward to the poll question we have here. So everyone, uh, if you could take a quick moment to submit an answer here, we would very much appreciate that. Um, this poll question will be up for the remainder of the presentation. Um, so with that being said, we'll go ahead and move forward to the Q&A section. As I say, we did get a couple of questions, and we have a little bit of time left over. Uh, so first question here is for Sajish. If I understood you right, a company should get their strategy and purpose straight first before moving forward. However, in our company, we have been stuck in digital strategy discussions for over two years. What can we do to get stuff moving? Uh, two years is a long time, definitely, <laughs> um, just to talk strategy. But the fact also remains in terms of, you know, what is what is the roadblock that has actually led to a two-year kind of a discussion around digital strategy. And probably the crisis is a good push to move ahead on. Um, I, I believe right now what I'm seeing across enterprises and across conversations is that everything that has stuck because of functional silo conversations um, you know, uh, different change management challenges, all of which are very critical roadblocks to the digital strategy, uh, has actually started giving way 
um, because of the pandemic and the crisis and the challenges that we are faced with. Right now, like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's no longer a finance initiative. So maybe I would uh, dust it up and kickstart the initiative all over again, and you might probably be surprised with uh, the kind of uh, conversations that comes in. That's point number one. Point number two is that there is a consistent question that is always raised when we talk about digital transformation, and that goes cuts across silos, across functions. That primary question is, what is in it for me? And if you are unable to actually answer what is in it for the salesperson, what is in it for my customer, what is in it for my uh, upstream processes, what is in it for my CFO, what is in it for my business as such, those and questions, if answered, then gives you a much more smoother uh, roadmap in terms of moving through. Great. So we have uh, another question here, and this one is for George. Uh, can you talk to what is available in the market specifically for prescriptive analytics? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> well, as far as prescriptive analytics, um, obviously Hybridius definitely has some good um, software out there that could uh, tie into your system. So that is uh, one thing that you could use. There are other companies that are out there, Bill Trust and so forth, that have as far as different programs. Big thing you have to keep in mind when you're trying to decide what you want to do is how does your current uh, ERP system fit into those different systems? So in other words, what information can you feed through um, their system to get you the maximum out that you're looking for? Don't know if that's quite answering the question. Great, uh, Laurent, Tajis, did you have anything to um, add to that? Sure. Um, I think I think pretty much any accounts receivable system of engagement today comes packed with embedded, like Lauren mentioned, with uh, the prescriptive analytics uh, capabilities that comes in. Right? Prescriptive analytics is basically a plethora of options and of regression models that exist. The bigger question would be uh, that, and I, and I doubt in the market if there is any AR system of engagement or platform that does not provide prescriptive analytics today. Um, the bigger question would be in terms of what exactly are you looking for? Am I looking for prescriptive analytics in terms of trying to assess my delinquency trends? Am I trying to look at claims reasons and the potential claims coming out of an invoice? Those are the kind of uh, very granular specific questions that will actually lead into a prescriptive analytics component uh, and then give you the insights that is necessary for it. Um, so simple answer, any AR system of engagement today out in the market would provide it. Uh, the question is how best to leverage it. Yeah, and, Thank you. and uh, for, for me, I would just add one thing. Uh, today, a lot of solutions will come across and telling or uh, advocating what they can do in terms of artificial intelligence or or, or prescript or or, or or prescriptive, and it's difficult to to judge the the reality. So I think at the end of the day, it's really about uh, 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 trying to understand what the the solution is providing and testing or showcasing what it really brings. Uh, before making any any uh, uh, any judgment call, the 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 one question which I tend to uh, to um, uh, or the, the the one element which I tend to to um, uh, to analyze is uh, w when a, any vendor of solution is coming to us and asking, okay, but what do you want to predict or what what kind of algorithm do you want to to implement, I think it's the wrong question. I'm, I'm just trying to, to go the other way around and tell me what you can uh, show us and, uh, and, and see what, what kind of answer you, you get from the different uh, uh, provider. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think Thank you guys for, oh, please, please proceed, please proceed. No, I think that there is a question that came across saying, yes, we have seen predictive and descriptive, probably not prescriptive. And I think one of the examples that you could leverage across is uh, of prescriptive analytics is predominantly in the use of machine learning on the cash application side. When you start looking at uh, literal remittance uh, trends and the machine by itself taking account of saying that this is the action that needs to be taken post 10 times of asking the uh, human what exactly would you take. 
and if it is consistent enough. So those kind of analytics offerings also exist within AR system of engagement. Just wanted to answer that. All right, so that is going to bring us to the end of the presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody so much for participating in the discussion today. If you had additional questions regarding today's topic that we didn't get to cover, or you'd like to connect with one of us to know more about the subject, please do feel free to reach out. Um, also, don't forget to check out the Credit Tech event LinkedIn page to obtain a copy of today's presentation and for the opportunity to join discussions with fellow attendees. Again, the link for this is available in the attachment section on your screen. The next session for today is going to be the town hall session, which will be starting now at 2.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, so please feel free to check this out. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining today and sharing the insight. And again, everyone, thank you so much for, for joining. And I hope you have a wonderful day.